Now you see that MOSFET is a three terminal device. So whichever terminal is ground, based on that, we have uh, three different configurations, okay? So you see the three basic uh, single, uh, single transistor amplifier configurations. They can be formed depending on which of the three transistor terminal is used as a signal ground. So for example, if the source is ground, you have a common source PMOS or NMOS uh, single transistor configuration. Similarly, if uh, you have a, the drain is common, then you have a source follower. The common drain is also known as source follower used in high frequency applications. Okay. Similarly, if the gate is common, you have a common gate configuration. Source is common, common source configuration. So these are three basic uh, distinct uh, single transistor uh, configurations. Okay. Now, um, now the the uh, the input and the output resistance characteristics of amplifier are important in determining the loading effect. By loading effect, it means that uh, each configuration is going to have a different loading effect. How much load does it? Um, how, how much does it loads the input source? It's different. Uh, for example, you don't have the 100% uh, uh, input signal at the gate source terminal if you are considering a non-zero uh, internal resistance of the source. Okay, so one so one configuration might load the input. Okay, similarly, you need to consider the output resistance as well if you are. Um, if you're going to design a multi-stage uh, transistor uh, amplifier, uh, it might load the output stage, okay? So the input-output resistances are different. So then we are also going to talk about uh, the voltage gain. The, these parameters like voltage gain of the three basic MOSFET configurations, they will be determined in the following sections. So the characteristics of uh, three types of amplifiers will then allow us to understand under what conditions each amplifier is the most useful. So to start with, let's uh, let's have a look at the first first the common source circuit with voltage divider biasing and the coupling capacitor. So you have a coupling capacitor that couples an AC source. You have a AC source VI, okay. And uh, this is represent this is my source which drives the amplifier. R1 and R2 forms the biasing resistances, okay. And uh, with BDD, this voltage division is going to determine your VGS, okay, VGS, the the source is at, uh, this VGS is the gate voltage, okay, because the source is at ground, so the, the source is grounded over here, so VGS is zero. This is an NMOS device, if you look at the current direction, it's uh, out from the source terminal. And then you have the drain resistance, okay, uh, at the output, so the output is being taken from the drain, the, term, the drain terminal. Uh, so, uh, you see this uh, the source is ground which means this is the common uh, terminal or the signal ground in the circuit configuration therefore this configuration is known as common source uh, single transistor based amplifier okay so common source circuit with voltage divider biasing and a coupling capacitor is shown in this configuration okay figure 14 is the basic uh, common source circuit with voltage divider biasing the purpose of this biasing circuit is to uh, is establish uh, the biasing point VGSQ, that's the DC VGS, okay? And it's independent of the AC VI. So you see that in AC equivalent, we're not going to consider the DC quantities, okay? You have to kill the AC sources uh, for DC analysis. So once you have the QSIN point, that is, you have the VDS and ID current, okay? Then uh, once this uh, Q point is determined, uh, then it, it's then that you solve the uh, solve for the small small signal uh, AC circuit parameters for the transistor, all right, and then find what is the voltage gain in terms of whatever is the input resistance, output resistance, etc., and the transconductance gain of transistors, right? But first we have to determine the uh, we have to determine the DC parameters, okay? So the signal from the signal source is coupled to the gate into the gate of the transistor. With the coupling capacitor CC over here, right? So CC is the coupling capacitor. Uh, it also provides the DC isolation between the amplifier and the signal source. So the DC transistor biasing is established by R and R2, which establish uh, the gate source voltage. Okay. So this VGSQ is important because this is going to determine your uh, drain current. Okay. VGS, if VGS is higher, okay, it has to be it has to be higher at least than 
uh, VTN, which is a threshold voltage where the transistor turns on. Once this is on, the transistor is either biased in the saturation or in the non-saturation region. And uh, for, for linear amplification purposes, you have to make sure that this ID current is the saturation current, right? Which does not depend on VDS, the output uh, voltage, all right? So if it is independent of VDS or uh, VDS is greater than VDS set, then transistor is in saturation region where you can use this configuration uh, for linear amplification purposes, okay? So we are going to solve some problems on how we can establish the operation of transistor uh, in the saturation region and set the Q point somewhere around the middle of the DC load line to have the maximum output swing. Okay, so we are going to talk about these uh, matters. So uh, the DC transistor, DC transistor biasing is established by R1 and R2. These are the biasing distances. And it's not disturbed when the signal source is capacitively coupled to the amplifier. Okay, it has nothing to do with the um, AC signals. Okay, the DC biasing is set by VDD and the uh, voltage divider. Okay, and this VGS <coughs> determines the DC quantity that is the ID that's the rate current. Okay, so uh, you have this uh, VDS uh, and ID which determines the Q point. All right. Uh, now, uh, for this for this coupling capacitors are concerned in these all these configurations, uh, let's assume that uh, for a signal, let's say a two kilohertz uh, or at least two kilohertz frequency, more than two kilohertz, uh, coupling capacitor, the capacitive reactance is small enough to assume the coupling capacitor to be short circuit in the equivalent AC circuit. So we are going to neglect the effect of uh, coupling capacitors, right? Uh, it's just there to uh, couple the AC signal. Otherwise, you don't need to consider it uh, the reactance, capacitive reactance of the equivalent circuit. So, for example, if the signal source is sinusoidal voltage at frequency F, then the magnitude of the capacitor impedance is given by 1 over 2 pi Fc. For example, assume the capacitor is of 10 microfarads. Frequency is 2 kilohertz of the input source. So, the magnitude of the capacitor impedance is given by 1 over 2 pi Fc. And if you plug those values of 2 kilohertz and 10 microfarad capacitor, coupling capacitor, uh, the magnitude of the capacitive reactance is 8 ohms. It's very small, uh, very small uh, capacitive reactance, right? At DC, capacitor is open. But as the frequency um, goes beyond 2 kilohertz, you don't need to even consider this, uh, the capacitive impedance, right? So we are going to ignore the capacitive impedance, which is a small quantity. So the magnitude of this impedance is generally much less than the Thevenin resistance at the capacitor terminals. Okay, so at the capacitor terminals, you're going to have uh, you're going to have the input resistance looking into this uh, amplifier configuration. Let's call this Ri. And uh, if you recall, if you are going to make the AC circuit out of it, uh, you have to you ignore this uh, CC. So if if you're going to make an AC current circuit, then we have this uh, uh, VI source that is your uh, let's say a source, of, a sinusoidal source of a certain frequency. Okay, so we'll keep VI, right? And uh, then we have a internal source uh, resistance RSI of the source. So I'm constructing the AC current circuit of uh, the common source amplifier. And uh, if we ignore uh, the, imp the reactive uh, impedance of CC, the coupling capacitor. Then you can go ahead and have a, a, a parallel combination of R1 and R2, right? So instead we'll have R1 in parallel to R2. Why is this? Because we are going to kill the DC sources for the equivalent AC circuit. Okay, so if you if you if you forget about this DC source over here, then uh, this is uh, this is the ground. Okay, this is an AC ground. And this ground is the same as this ground. Okay, so R1 comes in parallel to R2. And uh, then this becomes your uh, uh, VGS. Okay, that's your input gate to source uh, AC voltage that is available at VGS. Okay, this is not DC, this is an AC quantity. This is an AC quantity. DC established by the biasing resistors, but this is the DC quantity. So this part looking into the transistor is your input resistance of the amplifier, Ri, okay? And your biasing resistors have a very pronounced effect because uh, there's a pronounced effect on the input resistance. Uh, it's due to, because the gate uh, is 
inherently in the construction of the transistor is isolated. Okay, so gate between gate and the semiconductor substrate, there is an oxide over here. There is an oxide. Okay, so gate is insulated. So we ignore the gate capacitance. Okay, we assume the gate capacitance um, uh, is an open circuit. Okay, so we don't consider this input. The input resistance of transistor itself is is very high, so you don't need to consider. So the input resistance is uh, is R1 and R2. Then uh, you need to plug for in for the NMOS um, equivalent small signal model. And if you recall, in the last lectures, we considered this amplifier as a transconductance amplifier. By transconductor, what do you mean is that you have an input that is the voltage signal, okay, and the output is a current control device given by the magnitude of which is given by GM VGS. Okay, so this is GM. The transconductor skin, transconductance skin in amps per volts multiplied by VGS is amps. Okay, so the input is your um, input is the voltage, output is the current. So GM VGS is in amps. Okay, so this is basically your ID current, uh, AC component of the drain current, right? In this direction. Uh, then you have the output resistance of the transistor. Okay, output resistance of the transistor is R naught. And why do you have this output resistance? Well, the reason is, uh, if you consider an actual MOSFET device, the IV characteristics are not ideal. They are not flat with VDS. This is VDS, okay? Uh, in actual uh, operation of MOSFETs, there's something like this in the saturation region, it's not flat. So this is ID axis. And if you take the gradient of uh, ID VD curve over here, and take the inverse so the gradient of this curve is going to give you so if you take this partial id with respect to uh, vds vds okay take the inverse so the quantity becomes uh, you get the quantity in ohms okay so i'm talking about the inverse of this gradient this is the output resistance these are the IV characteristics characteristics of the mosfet device and this gives you the output resistance of the mosfet okay and we have talked about this in details and why it happens is that you, your current ideally is supposed to be independent of VDS, but it turns out that uh, the horizontal electric field that is being applied due to the drain source output voltage that exists, it modulates the channel width. That means the channel resistance is changing, okay? So, and that channel resistance is changing um, instantaneously, instantaneously based on whatever the value of VDS is, is, is at, that point, at, at that point in time. It is dependent on VDS, okay? So you have the output resistance due to this effect. Um, then uh, with this output resistance of the, uh, to have the complete picture of the common source output resistance, let's call this R0, we have to consider RD, okay? This is also ground. So RD comes in parallel with R0. R0 is my uh, MOSFET or NMOS uh, output resistance, but RD is external circuit resistance, okay? So basically this part, this part is a small signal uh, NMOS AC, I'll call it NMOS small signal equivalent circuit model, NMOS transconductance small signal model, okay? And basically this is my, um, this is my output resistance looking from here, okay? This is my output resistance. And my output resistance is nothing but R naught in parallel with RD. And then I have this output, which is V naught. Okay, this is purely an AC quantity, which you can also write this as VDS. Okay, because source terminal is that source terminal is a common, it's an AC ground. So V naught is basically VD. You're taking this output from the drain, right? Source is common. Source is common, and you're applying the input at the gate. This is your gate terminal, right? This is gate. Okay, so this is the source is common this I can write this source okay so if you look at the current direction it's output from the source down into the uh, ground okay so the direction of the current is as such as shown in the current control device and uh, then this is the drain terminal okay this is the drain terminal all right so uh, this is your AC current circuit right so you you can see that if you construct this AC current circuit uh, we are not considering any capacitive reactance, okay? But 
we have to consider the loading due to this uh, biasing resistances and the uh, external input uh, resistance of the source. Why? Because your VGS over here is not equal to VI. You see that VGS is not equal to VI. You see why? Because um, if I there's a voltage divided, there's a voltage division which is happening between the internal source resistance RSI of the source and uh, the biasing resistances which are coming in parallel in the AC current circuit R1 and R2, okay, which is my input resistance. So VGS is then equal to the parallel combination R1 R2, okay, R1 R2. So it's, it's a voltage division R1 R2 divided by again the parallel combination R1 R1 R2 plus I have another source resistance of the source of the driving AC source that is RSI plus RSI multiply by multiply by VI okay multiply by VI now RSI should be a much smaller quantity ideally as compared to R1 parallel combination of R1 and R2 so that all the VGS all the VI the input voltage appears as VGS but practically you will see uh, for the uh, practical circuits you have this values as 92 95% 90% of the input voltage so that's the input loading uh, due to this voltage division which is constructed over here right so you have to understand these parameters uh, if you're going to construct if you have to analyze the AC if you have to do the AC analysis of the circuit so you must uh, understand what is the input resistance what is the loading effect what is the output resistance okay uh, what is the voltage gain for example okay over here this is v naught so you can see that uh, uh, the output voltage is very uh, easy to write this is like uh, you have this current source so owing to the direction of the current you can write it as such minus gm into vgs that's my current the drain current multiply by the two resistances that are coming in parallel and that's the output resistance r naught into rd okay r naught parallel combination of rd that's not multiplication that's parallel combination so it's basically uh, your uh, r naught into rd over r naught plus rd right the minus sign signifies that uh, there's a voltage inversion the one degree phase shift between uh, input and output voltage okay so for both pmos and most common source circuit configurations there's a, there's a 180 degree phase shift okay you have to uh, you have to deal with that no way out uh, right so uh, so the voltage gain is uh, v naught by vgs not exactly vgs but you will have this uh, v naught by vi because this is the input voltage and for vi you have to plug this for vgs over here which is the loading effect right uh, so you can you can find the uh, you will have the expression for the voltage gain as well for this configuration okay as v naught by vi right and this voltage gain will be negative emphasizing the fact that there is a 180 degree uh, phase shift between the output and the input waveforms right but we have seen this in the circuit we have ignored the capacitive reactance right so uh, so we will therefore assume that the capacitor is essentially a short circuit to the signals the frequency is greater than two kilohertz and we'll also neglect in this discussion any capacitance effects within the transistor so for example we are going to neglect the gate capacitance over here okay uh, so, so uh, the gate capacitance is is also going to appear as an open circuit okay now uh, okay so we have already constructed uh, this is the same uh, basically the same ac circuit that we have constructed uh, we have this uh, biasing resistances in parallel with the signal ground this is your gate this is drain right and then you have the source over here and this is a transconductor amplifier which takes the input as the voltage vgs and the output is the current id um, it is drawn over here same thing this is the input uh, resistance right this is the input voltage at the gate and then you have the drain current which is the current control device sources at the ground since the source is at the ground uh, now, now the, the source uh, remember this as uh, the source and the body of the transistor both are at the common ground so there is no body effect when there is no body effect you don't have another ac component so that means you don't have a second current source due to 
VBS, that is the bulk to source uh, voltage. Okay, so there is no VBS, VBS is zero over here. So bulk, the body, and the source part of the source terminal of the transistor, there's no potential difference, it's zero, right? So there is no, no need to consider another uh, back transconductance parameter and there is no other though so there, there's only a single current source okay that comes with the input input uh, voltage right okay now the output resistance over here consists of the output of the transistor and rd as you can see in this circuit okay R, rd is the uh, circuit parameter external circuit uh, but r naught is inherent uh, and that is the transistor output resistance okay so for the circuit shown in figure 14 assume that the transistor is biased in the saturation region by the transistors by the resistors r1 and r2 okay and that the signal frequency is sufficiently large for the coupling capacitor to act essentially as a short circuit you see as the frequency becomes higher uh, the capacitive reactance decreases okay so we assume that the signal frequency is high so that we don't consider any um, capacitive reactance at the gate terminal of the coupling capacitor the signal source is represented by a thalamin equivalent circuit in which the signal source vi is in series with an equivalent source resistance so this part over here is your uh, signal part uh, signal source part with an external uh, thalamin equivalent resistance as rsi and the voltage as vi okay rsi should be much less than the amplifier input resistance uh, and in, in input ri is the amplifier resistance which is given as a parallel combination of r1 and r2 so in order to minimize the loading effect okay which means that your VGS should be VGS should be approximately equal to VI, okay? And that is only possible. This condition is only possible if you have RSI, that is your uh, internal resistance of the source, or resistance of the source. You can say uh, it should be much much less than R1 parallel R2, okay? So that is uh, th this condition is there to minimize uh, the loading due to the source. Okay, so figure 15 shows the resulting small signal equivalent circuit. The small signal variables, such as the input signal, voltage VI, are given in the figure form. Okay. Okay. Um, so th what we have over here is since now the sources are the ground potential, you can see the source is ground potential. There is no body effect. Okay, so we already talked VSB is zero. So there is no potential difference between the body bulk and the source. So VSB is zero. So we are not considering any body effect. The output voltage is therefore given as the output voltage is at the drain. This is the drain terminal. Okay. And you can see <clears throat> the direction of current is as such that is flowing over here. Uh, it's given by uh, minus GM VGS r naught rd okay so r naught rd is a parallel combination of for the output resistance r naught and uh, gm vgs is the magnitude of the ac drain current okay so id r naught parallel rd is the output voltage at the drain where this uh, this parameter is the output uh, resistance of the amplifier of the common source amplifier okay r naught r naught is the output uh, resistance of the amplifier circuit in the common source configuration. Now the input uh, gate to source voltage VGS due to the loading effect you can see due to the voltage divider so this is your RI okay looking into the amplifier and that is given by as RI over RI plus RSI okay this is uh, your series source resistance into VI okay where RI is your uh, is given as a parallel combination of R1, R1, parallel combination with R2, okay? This is R1, this is R1, right? R1, okay? So, uh, you, you see over here, you, you you must have RSI as a very small quantity so that, uh, so, in, so in order to minimize the loading, okay? Uh, so that uh, a large part, a large fraction of the uh, input voltage appears at the gate source voltage, okay, but if RSI becomes uh, Comparable to RI then there's a significant voltage drop and uh, The loading increases, okay on the source the loading increases 
So the small signal voltage gain is there for the ratio of the output voltage divided by the input voltage. Okay, the input voltage is over here, and that is given as minus gm r naught r d. Okay, now if you recall over here, this is your v naught, so you have to substitute vgs over here, right? If you do that, then you have this uh, ri over ri plus rsi. You can take vsi. You sorry, you can take the input voltage to the uh, left hand side of the equation, and that forms the voltage gain. Okay. And note that this voltage gain is negative, which signifies 100 degree phase reversal. Okay. Uh, so in the last videos, if you recall, it doesn't matter if you consider a PMOS or an MOS device, a common source configuration is always going to produce uh, a phase reversal. Okay, between the input and output voltage waveform. Now, uh, figure 16 over here is the DC load line, and uh, it shows the transition point that separates the saturation and the non-sat regions. Uh, over here, you see that this total line is separating the non sat, and this is your non sat region. Okay, non sat region. This is the transition line, broken pink dotted line. And then uh, there, there is a supposedly a saturation region over here. Okay, so in saturation region, ideally, uh, the curves would be like you won't have this uh, uh, dependence of, on VDS, ideally. Uh, your drain current will be independent of uh, so this is ID sat, this is ID sat, and this will be independent of VDS. Okay, this is ID. So uh, the DC load line, figure uh, 16 is uh, it has the DC load line. This is the DC load line which has having a slope of minus one over RD, and it also shows the transition point. The separate the separate saturation bias and the non-saturation uh, bias region. It shows the Q point in which uh, which is in the saturation region for the transistor to operate as a linear amplifier. Okay. Now the DC load line consists of two points. Now if you uh, look at this circuit again, uh, and if you have to do the DC analysis, then forget about this part because the capacitor is open to DC. So let's not uh, consider this part for DC analysis. Uh, but over here. Uh, since V naught is again, so this is this will be a capital V naught, and this will be equal to V D S. All right. Note that V D S, when V D S becomes equal to V D D, I D is zero. Okay, because it is an open circuit. I mean, there is no current since the output uh, K V L is of the form V D D minus I D R D minus I D R D is equal to VDS, that's the output voltage, right? VDS. Then uh, you can write this since VDS and ID is the variable, okay? Uh, you can reformulate this equation to write it as such ID is equal to, uh, well, this will be equal to VDD minus VDS minus VDS. Or I can write this as one over RD. Okay. VDS divided by RD over here. Okay. The same thing. I mean, you just you can reformulate this. So you can see this. Uh, the gradient is one over RD, right? The gradient is uh, one over RD. So uh, that's the same thing you see over here. So when uh, VDS when VDS becomes equal to VDD. The current is zero, okay, and the slope of uh, the line is minus one over RD, right? And upper RD max, you have this VDD over RD where uh, VDS is zero, where VDS is zero. So to make this VDS is equal to zero, you have this uh, when, when, when VDS is, is zero, ID is VDD over RD. So you you have the two points, okay, just join this, and whenever they wherever they intersect, this is the Q point, okay. So preferably this Q point. For linear amplification and to have a maximum swing, it should be somewhere in the middle of the saturation region. So that means that from the transition point, that is the transition from non-sat to sat, this is the point, okay, where this line is intersecting the. Uh, so this is determining the uh, non-sat region on the left and on the the left side, the right side you have the, uh, the saturation region, and uh, this is the cutoff region where the current is zero, okay. So somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle. Why is that? Because you can have a max, you can accommodate the maximum swing. If the Q point 
is near cut off well the output can be clipped off okay we don't want that so for linear amplification purposes and to have the maximum swing output swing remember that q point should be biased somewhere in the middle of the load line so this is your q point your idq and vd is q now in order to provide the maximum uh, symmetrical output voltage swing and keep the transistor bias in the saturation region q point must be near the middle of the saturation region okay so it should be halfway between uh, your uh, non sat region and the cutoff region okay so that you can have a maximum swing at the same time the input signal must be small enough for the amplifier to remain linear you see if the input signal is large what happens what happens is that you have a large uh, vi swing okay when there's a large vi swing that means there is a, there's a large vgs swing okay and when there's a large vgs swing the q point is going to uh, over here the q point is going to move up and down so the, due, due to the large swing you will have a have a output voltage that could be clipped like this okay you will have a sinusoid that is clipped you don't have a nice sinusoid i mean instead of having something like this you will have this clipped portions okay you don't want that you don't want that so your input signal must be small enough for the amplifier to remain linear that that's what it means okay if the swing is large so the q point is going to shift towards cut off and then it's going to shift towards non sat regions your output is going to be clipped so the transistor won't be linear the input output resistances of the amplifier can be determined from figure 15 right you can see over here this is this was your input resistance output resistance can be seen in terms of uh, the external resistance rd and the output resistance r naught of the transistor so the output resistance looking back uh, into the output terminal is formed by setting the impedance source vi equal to zero which means vgs is zero that means the output resistance is therefore rd combination parallel combination of r naught and the input resistance is your parallel combination of the biasing resistances r1 and r2 okay so if you look back from here uh, forget about this vi source okay it's an open circuit then uh, uh, the output resistance is nothing but rd combination of r naught these two resistances okay now let's consider an example this is uh, example 4.3 from the course deck uh, the objective is to determine the small signal voltage gain the input and output resistances of the common source amplifier so we are considering the same circuit configuration of the common source uh, amplifier this is the common source and mos uh, single transistor amplifier and uh, what we are given is for this uh, circuit of figure 14 at the parameters we are given vdd as 3.3 volts rd is given as uh, 10 kilos okay r1 and r2 are given as 140 and 60 these passing resistances r1 and r2 are 140 and 60 respectively the source resistance output source resistance is 4 kilo ohms transistor parameters are threshold voltage given 0.4 volts conduction parameters 0.5 milliamp volt square and the channel modulation parameters given in volts in verse 0.02 so to start with, let's first assume the transistor. Uh, let's first let's first find that uh, what what is VGS, okay? And uh, VGS, I suppose, whatever you find uh, find it out, should be at least the threshold voltage, at least greater than threshold voltage, because that will require the transistor to turn on, okay? So let's see with VDD with VDD. If you apply the voltage, uh, do you know over here, okay? That's given as R2 over R1 plus R2 into VDD. You plug those values of uh, the resistances r1 and r2 140 and 60 so r2 is 60 and 140 plus 60 3.3 is 0.9 volts and if you compare this with the threshold voltage which is given as over here as 0.4 volts uh, your transistor is on okay the transistor is on now whether the, whether the transistor is biased in the saturation region or in the non sat region has to be determined by the uh, transition point the separate two regions so how to do that well <clears throat> let's assume first the transistor is biased in the saturation region to find the qcent drain current and <clears throat> if you recall it's a quadratic relation between the vgs and vtn so we find the these are these are all the, the dc quantities okay we are we are doing the dc analysis okay there's nothing is over here so you can forget about this part we're not even considering this okay it's not there uh, capacitor is open so okay id is uh, given as 
Kn Vgs minus Vtn whole square in saturation. This is the saturation current, not, not non sat period, because we are assuming that the transistor is on and it is somewhere biased in the uh, saturation region. So if our assumption is true, then we are beyond our pass beyond the uh, VDS sat. So Kn is 0.5. If you plug those values over here, uh, we have VGS of 0.99 and we have the threshold voltage as 0.4 volts. If you plug those values, you find that ID is 0.174 milliamps. Okay, and we are assuming that this is um, this is in, this is the saturation current. So to check if the transistor is indeed biased in the saturation region, uh, you see the output. If you apply the KVL at the output, then uh, VDS because S the source is at zero, so Vs is at zero. So basically, the output voltage is your Vd, right? I mean, the DC output voltage is Vd. So this VDS is given as VDS is Vd, okay? So which is given as Vdd minus the drop at Rd, Vdd minus Id Rd. So 3.3 minus uh, 0.174 into 10 gives you 1.56 volts as the DC output voltage. Now, this is greater than VDS set, which is given as the overdrive voltage of VGS minus VTN. Now, VGS is determined as 0.99 volts before. And the difference with the threshold voltage is 0.59 volts. Okay, we know that the transistor is on. So, you can see that VDS is greater than VDS set. VDS set is the overdrive voltage, which is 0.59 volts. But we are passed beyond this point, okay, which means that this, for example, this point is at 0.59 volts. So, we are, we are uh, on the VDS axis. If this is your transition point, then we are somewhere over here, okay, which is 1.56, I suppose, something like that, okay, 1.56 or 1.59, yeah, 1.56, so 1.56 is greater than 0 0.59, therefore, we are in the, in the right side, okay, of the tra this transition point, so the transistor is biased in the saturation region, it's indeed biased in the saturation region, so the analysis, the assumption was correct, okay. So now once we know that the transistor is biased in the saturation region, uh, we can go ahead and construct a linear amplifier. So for that, um, uh, to check what is the voltage gain in terms of the uh, resistances R1, R2 and the transconductance gain, we have to find first of all what is the transconductance gain GM. Uh, then we have to find the input and output resistances to see the loading effects. So let's do that. So now the small signal voltage gain, uh, the small signal transconductance parameter is first uh, found as twice square root of Kn IDQ. Okay, Kn is given. IDQ was found at, as the saturation current 0.174 milliamps. Okay, you plug those values over here. This is your transcription gain in amps per volts. Okay, now we, we found this expression uh, in the previous videos. If you recall, if you have to go back, just watch those videos uh, where we talked about this transcription gain. Uh, this is uh, the ratio of the output of the output current to the input voltage, which is VGS, okay? Uh, so I'm just trying to look if we can find this. Yeah, over here, even you can, you can see that the transcriptance gain uh, over here is uh, the uh, drain current, the AC drain current, the ratio of the AC drain current to the input AC gate source voltage, okay? And that is purely in terms of the DC quantities, okay? And this uh, this can also be expressed as in terms of uh, your conduction parameter and IDQ. So this can be written as KN IDQ, okay? So you might want to watch the, the earlier videos on the transconductance gain of, uh, how we determine the transconductance gain of the MOSFET, okay? Uh, so you see over here, yeah, we, we used this before as well. But uh, if, you, if you want to uh, have a quick, uh, recovery of the memory, it was like this. You see, we consider this uh, same saturation IV characteristics and VGS were replaced by the DC and AC quantities, okay? Now, if you expand this, the first term over here, this is the same expression. This is the purely DC term. Then you have DC and AC term. This is AC term, this is DC term. This is purely AC term, okay? <clears throat> and we assume that VGS is much, much less than two VGS Q minus VTN because this term produce harmonics. So we, and the small signal conditions ignore this term, okay? Now, if you consider the AC part, this is the DC part. So that means that the drain current is going to have both DC and AC currents. And uh, basically your ID is uh, is this part, is this part, okay? If you take the ratio of uh, 
ID divided by VGS and you look at the second term then you are left with nothing but twice scan twice scan into VGSQ minus VTN okay so that's your uh, that's your transcriptor scan okay and since this part is your DC part call this IDQ so you can express this I mean this is the square root I mean if you have to express this in terms of the uh, DC part of the drain current you can write this as twice <coughs> under root of IDQ KN okay because there's a KN over here as well so you can write this as KN IDQ it's the same thing so that's your transcription again that's what we are using okay so this is your transcription again still in uh, amps per volt this is amps per volts right okay now uh, let's get back to that uh, example we are discussing about the common source now we have this uh, um, we have the DC analysis so we know we know what is VGS and we assume that the drain current is saturation the saturated current and uh, we confirm that the transistor is indeed in the saturation region then comes the small signal parameters. So the first of all, we determine the transconductance gain. Uh, then the small signal output resistance. If you look at this um, uh, small signal AC model, okay, so R naught is the output resistance of the transistor, okay, and uh, we also derive this expression in terms of the channel width modulation. So the, the difference is that with this uh, uh, expression comes another parameter 1 plus lambda VDS. Now if you take the derivative of uh, ID, ID versus VDS and take the inverse of the gradient, I mean the, so the gradient of ID versus VDS, take the inverse, you find this as R0, okay. Because if you do so, uh, you don't need to consider this first term. Uh, there's no VDS over here. It will leave you with lambda Kn VGS minus VTN square uh, VDS. Okay. And uh, uh, no VDS. Okay. Then uh, just take the inverse of that to find R0. If you do do that, we have done that before. Uh, just watch some previous videos. You will find that this is equal to 1 over lambda IDQ. A lambda is given to you before in this problem. 0.02. Just plug those values to find the output resistance of the MOSFET, and then the R0 in parallel with RD is your output resistance R0. Okay. The input resistance to the amplifier is R1 parallel R2, which is 140 parallel 60, and that comes 42 kilo ohms. So from the output voltage, the small signal voltage gain becomes V0 uh, over here. V0 is equal to um, minus GM. VGS R0 parallel combination RD. Okay, so this GM VGS is your drain current, it's the AC drain current, right? R0 RD is your output resistance. Output resistance R0 over here. So uh, uh, for VGS, you might want to substitute this for VI, okay, because the output voltage gain is V0 by VI, but then you have to apply the voltage division between RSI and R1 and R2. Okay, so if you do that, R1, R2 uh, divided by RSI, R1, R2, that is your input resistance. You, you, then you plug these values in and you'll find out that this voltage gain is 5.2, okay. So the input output resistance is again R0, you can find this uh, from the output resistance of the uh, transistor and RD is external transistor 10 kilo ohms, that is 9.66 kilos. And the input resistance is R1, R2, that is 42 kilos. So all, so all that you need for these uh, um, AC parameters to construct the AC current circuit, and which includes the small signal model of the transistor, you have the transconductance gain, GM, or here, okay? You have R0, the output resistance, as well as combination R0, RD, okay? We evaluated R0 first. Then we have the input resistance, RI. So everything is known for the small signal uh, AC model. So the comment is, the resulting Q point is not at the center of the saturation region. Okay, we don't make sure that the Q point uh, lies uh, at the center, which is there to ensure the the output swing is symmetrical and is maximum. Okay, 
So for that, uh, we, we didn't uh, design the, or we didn't uh, call it, we didn't uh, select it R1 and R2, RD, which supposedly will give the Q point because R1 and R2 are establishing your uh, VTS, right? They are responsible to bias the transistor in the saturation region. But in the saturation region, it has to be in the middle, okay? And you cannot go in the saturation close to non-sat or the cutoff region. So in order to do that, you have to ensure that R1 and R2 are such that VGS is, in, is, is, uh, VGS is so that, that VDS and IDQ are somewhere in the middle of the load line, okay? So for that, in this problem, R1 and R2 were given. We didn't select it, so uh, we are limited by whatever the swing we are going to get. Therefore, the circuit does not achieve the maximum symmetrical output voltage swing in this case. So the small signal uh, input gate to source voltage is given as VGS as RI, RSI, RI, VI, which is about 91% of VI. This is the loading effect, right? I mean, this RSI is not zero, right? Although we are not considering the capacitive uh, impedance at the signal frequency, uh, but there is RSI, which is the resistance you cannot ignore, and this resistance is of four kilo, okay, as compared to the parallel combination of R1 R2, which is 42 kilos. But it does produces so this part does produces the loading, right? This is your loading part. This loads the MOSFET, the input of the MOSFET. So this is 42 over uh, 4 plus 42 is 9, uh, 42 over 46 is 91%. So you get 91% of the input signal at the gate terminal, okay? So since RSI is not zero, the amplifier input VGS is approximately 91% of the available signal voltage. This is called the loading effect. Even though the input resistance to the gate of the transistor is essentially infinite, the bias resistor greatly influences the amplifier input resistance. Okay, now the input resistance will be R1 parallel R2 and the loading effect. And this loading effect can be eliminated or minimized if you consider the co constant current source biasing. Okay, so you eliminate the R1 and R2 sources over here. Uh, you might not be needing those sources, R1 and R2. You, you can have a, a constant current source that can bias the trans the MOSFET and then again they, they will be enhancement type or uh, some mirror type uh, MOSFETs okay as current sources uh, which are not going to produce any loading okay at the input so all the signal that you have available at VI it will be available as VGS okay as VGS so right now we have, uh, by the, from this configuration and these particular values, they are producing VGS as 91% of VI. That's the loading effect. Okay. So what we can do is we can eliminate R and R to the biasing resistances. And instead we can use MOSFETs as current devices. Uh, so with that we can have a constant uh, current biasing. Therefore eliminating need of biasing resistances and therefore minimizing the uh, loading effect. Okay. That's all.